This is a Red V podcast documentary detailing the incredible 1996 season by the St. George Dragons. Don't forget to like us on social media, on Facebook, the Red V Podcast, on Twitter, at Red V Podcast One, Instagram, the Red V Podcast, and Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Red V Podcast. We hope you enjoy this incredible three-part journey of the St. George Dragons 1996 season. Monday! The narrative of the St. George Dragons 1996 season is a complex one. At its best, it tells the dramatic rag-to-riches story of the side with the Big Red V. A season where they defied all the odds. Ten players at pre-season training, no coach, players training at other clubs, as well as the dark cloud of Super League hanging over their heads to somehow make it all the way to the grand final. At its worst, it shows fans how close St George was to a shattering demise and extinction. How on earth did they do it? Well, this is how. This is the story of the 1996 St George Dragons. accurately portray the St. George Dragons comeback story, we need to backtrack several years before 1996 to gain some context. The Dragons had a very successful period pre-1990s. The Harry Bath coach sides had secured premierships in 1977 and 1979 to restore pride in the Red V after a barren run of 11 seasons without a premiership. The Dragons had famously won 11 premierships in a row from 1956 to 1966. His crop of young players, affectionately labelled Bass Babes, took St George to the summit twice in the space of three years. Many of these players continued to play well into the 1980s and the success snowballed under new coach Roy Masters. A preliminary final defeat to Parramatta in 1984 was followed by a grand final defeat in 1985 against Canterbury. Unfortunately, the lack of forward planning by the Dragons' management and the loss of key players such as Michael O'Connor, slippery Steve Morris, the long-term suspension of talented halfback Steve Lenane, as well as the release of a host of players at the end of the 1985 season saw the Dragons become the also-rans of the competition. It wasn't until the appointment of Brian Smith in 1991 that the Dragons eventually made it back to play semi-final football and the club was turned around. Grand final appearances followed in 1992 and 1993, as well as a semi-final appearance in 1995. A crop of young and enthusiastic players had been established, including the talented, brash-talking and exciting Anthony Mundine. Mundine, the son of Australian boxer Tony Mundine, was equally adept with his hands in the boxing ring as he was throwing a cutout pass for the Dragons. Boxing would be his calling in future years, but for now he was one of St George's most potent attacking threats. Noel Goldthorpe had taken the reins at the halfback position in 1992 having joined from Western Suburbs and refused to relinquish them. Not a flashy player, but with great vision and a brilliant kicking game, those skills complemented Mundine to a T. Elsewhere in the back line, Saints had towering winger Nick Zisti and veteran Ricky Walford, whilst veterans Mark Bell and skipper Mark Coyne led from the front and barely put a foot wrong. 
In the forwards, Jason Stevens had turned into one of the top props in the game. Gordon Tallis had a breakout season in 1995, and it would come as a huge loss by him not playing a game in 1996. David Barnhill, Scott Goulet, and the recently recruited Queenslander Wayne Bartram made up one of the most formidable back rows in the competition. 1995 ended in disappointing fashion with a semi-final defeat to Premier's Canterbury after a breathtaking seven-match winning streak and nine wins out of their last ten to charge into the semi-finals. That said, there was optimism that 1996 would be the year that Saints could go several games better. Everything seemed to be looking up for the Saints during the 1990s, and then the Super League war broke out. A three-year tussle for rugby league supremacy between the ARL and News Corp. The Dragons, like every other club, were caught right up in the middle of it. Players were signed to massive deals, enticed to other clubs, loyalties were tested, and friendships destroyed. Here, second rubber Scott Goulet talks about the impact that the Super League war and the amount of money that was being thrown around took on the St George club as a whole. Yeah, it was quite disruptive and, you know, I think it affected a lot of the young players a lot too. Like, they, you know, they were all of a sudden getting a lot of money and, mm. you know, struggling how to handle their finances and, you know, driving around in fancy cars, not, not realising they had to pay tax on the money and stuff like that. It was, yeah, it was... You know, the players probably needed a bit more uh, financial help as well. Um, yeah, but it was disruptive. And, it, like, it was difficult at St George at the time, especially at the end of the season, because, um, you know, Brian Smith left. Um, you know, we weren't sure who was going to coach. I think Rod Reddy was going to coach. And then, you know, he pretty much signed with Super League. And, because I remember at the time, I, you know, I was trying to work out what I was going to do because uh, the Roosters came and offered me did I want to go uh, to the Roosters in 97 and I went back to Sir George and said I don't really want to go what, you know mm. what should I do and they they you know the people I talked to were pretty much saying well, they're not sure if Sir George is going to be there next year to make matters worse Jeff Carr the Dragons CEO at the time had been having private talks throughout 1994 and 1995 with the Eastern Suburbs Rooster Supremo Nick Politis about a possible merger between East and St George. The Dragons' name, jersey and colours would all disappear if successful. Thankfully, the SOS Save Our Saints group stepped in and the merger was voted down 6-2 at board level. With uncertainty surrounding the St George club coming into 1996, it would have been hard for things to get any worse. Yet they did. Brian Smith, who had been at the helm since 1991, departed in late 1995 to take up a coaching opportunity with the Bradford Bulls in the English Super League. Privately, Smith felt that he had taken St George as far as he could. He had rebuilt the club from the sorry state of affairs it was in at the end of 1990 and taken them to two grand finals as well as an exciting run to the semi-finals in 1995. However, it was his parting words that left more than a sour taste in the mouth of St George fans. In lamenting what he saw as the demise of Saints, Smith was critical of a St George board which he believed had become too conservative. It is tragic to see a team that went within a whisker of winning the competition for two straight years being decimated, Smith said. I think there was a real smell of Newtown to the place. Smith was referring to Newtown's untimely exit in 1983, a club that he was coaching at at the time. St George reserve grade coach Rod Reddy was quickly installed as head coach, but that too soon spelt bad news. Despite telling players at the last pre-season training before Christmas that he was committed to the club and would be there in 1996, Reddy abruptly quit the club days later after being tempted by a sizable offer from one of the new Super League franchises, the Adelaide Rams. This left the Dragons high and dry as Reddy took the entire St George coaching staff with him. In a parting shot, he said St George wouldn't survive another two to three years. With no coach and seemingly no future, there was a mass exodus of players leaving the club to train with other clubs. Noel Goldthorpe went up to the new franchise Hunter Mariners. Nathan Brown and Jason Stevens trained with Cronulla. 
Gordon Tallis moved back up to Brisbane and refused to play with St George for the entirety of 1996. Anthony Mundine was signed to both ARL and Super League, and there was question marks over his return, plus solid club players Nick Zisti and Jason Donnelly were also missing due to their alliances with Super League. Dragons second rower Jeff Hardy shares his memories of what the St George club was like at the beginning of 1996 with so much uncertainty around. You know, just the makeup of, of our club for that year, that was the worry. You know, obviously a lot of youngsters are going to get a start here and how well we're going to go, well, who knows? <laughs> you know, because um, it, was, it was 96 and... Um, it was it was a big t- big competition that year. It was a lot of t- a lot of teams, and and so talent was spread across a lot of teams. So, um, yeah, it was it was a lot of unknowns going into '96 about firstly who was coaching and how we're going to go, and what about our players that were signed mm. here that are now gone? Um, how are we going to make up for those that all the players have already signed and elsewhere? So, um, you know, what, what's going to happen? To top all the bad news off, Penfolds had rescinded their sponsorship at the end of the 1995 season. Thankfully, local businessman Martin Newman, owner of Newman's Motor Group at Cogra, himself a Dragons Tragic, stepped in and sponsored the club when they needed him most. New CEO Brian Johnson was quickly put to work in attempts to find a new coach. He settled on former Newcastle coach David Waite, who had taken the Knights to the semi-finals in 1992 and drafted the Johns brothers into first grade. A serious coach with an analytical mind and a work ethic rivaling Brian Smith, Waite was quick to say he would only worry about the things that he could control. I was lucky enough at the time to, to be given the, uh, the opportunity to get back into first grade coaching again. And uh, it happened very, very quickly. From a phone call while I was on holidays a phone call from Brian Johnson to a meeting with Brian Johnson on New Year's Day to be back here within three or four days working under Cars Park with a bunch of players who didn't know me and uh, only two of which I'd ever had anything to do with before and and, uh, the officials that were still with the team telling me they were going to go to Adelaide so it was a a very very interesting time in the the history of St George but as uh, as history will show that uh, we were able to secure up the stocks and and sort of write a fairy tale in those There was the feeling at Saints that the Dragons hadn't lost out when Reddy left the club in late 1995 to be replaced by David Waite. Waite was fortunate that he had one of the best deputies in the game in the shape of the loyal Mark Coyne. As one of the most highly respected figures in the game, Coyne's loyalty to St George and the ARL had paved the way for the famous club to stay with the ARL during the uncertain times. Coyne himself a Queensland representative who had starred in the 1994 and 1995 Origin Series for the Maroons had persuaded teammates and the club to stick firm when Super League may have been the more enticing decision. Moving to St George from the Brothers Club in 1988, Coyne would start his eighth season in first grade in 1996 with the Saints. His leadership would be a hot talking point throughout the season. Oh, it was pretty a pretty hard period to, to, to get over. I mean, we had St George were probably in a real a real hard position because you know there were, were players a lot about eight or nine players who wanted to go to Super League and the club were trying to stay at ARL, but then the players all walked out and went to their Super League clubs and St George and then were going through the stage of will they or won't they go? And from a captain's point of view, it was a very difficult time because all the younger players were asking me what was going on, but I couldn't tell them the answer because. No one from the club was telling me anything, so it was a pretty difficult, difficult time for us. And uh, but we got through it. '96 came around, and uh, and most of our players walked out again. As I said, they went to their Super League clubs, so we turned up the training. And even Rod Reddy had, had sort of left as well, so we had no coach, and and we had about 10 or 11 players that were left. Uh, but slowly and surely, you know, we got David Wade in, and other uh, players slowly lost their court cases, so they all made to come back. And, Everybody did except for Gordon Tallis, which was a bit of a shame because we probably could have used Gordon that year. And, and uh, we built a pretty special feeling that year. I think of all, all the years I played at the club, 96 was my most favourite because we came from absolutely nowhere to get to the grand final. And uh, the feeling that we had leading up into that grand final was just quite a strong bond that I'd never felt before. Dragons' first pre-season hit out spelt trouble as only 10 players turned up for David Waite's first session in charge. Mark Coyne, the captain, and senior players Wayne Bartram and Jeff Hardy were in attendance with a smattering of others. 
it was a real worry, you know, with with what was going on, and um, and players were going left, right, and center, and and they had Super League deals, but Super League wasn't going to happen, so they were lining themselves with Super League clubs um, and going to training with them. And and as Mark said, I remember looking at Mark and going, "What about what about how we're looking here?" You know, and 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 as you said, it, you know, Rocket had had gone as well, and. And I think this is going to be this could be a tough year for us. If if, if we're a real tough year by the looks of things, it's going to be. Yeah, I still remember him as well. At Cars Park, we turned up, and um, there wasn't the personnel there that was was there the previous <laughs> year. With so many senior and solid first graders missing, Waite and his coaching staff had to delve into the youth and promote several talented youngsters who would have admitted that it may have been a touch too soon. Damien Smith, Ben Custo, Jim Lenahan, and Scott Murray were some of the names that St George fans got used to in the early stages of the season with so many key players missing. In showing his class, retired Dragons winger Ricky Walford offered to play on in 1996 due to the Super League tearing apart the Dragons. Confidence was high, however, after St George took out the trophy final of the Coca-Cola 1996 World Sevens. The pre-season sevens tournament was seen as a bit of a novelty, yet it provided the Dragons with a welcome distraction from the media bombardment over the future of the club. It also gave the Dragons some valuable match fitness and preparation with some of the Dragons' young players getting some valuable reps out in the middle. The Sydney Football Stadium would be a happy hunting ground for St George during 1996 and it was kind to them during a hot and humid February weekend to kickstart the 1996 campaign. The Dragons dropped into the trophy side of the tournament after an 18-14 loss to Sydney City, coupled with a 44-8 drubbing of Japan. Scott Goulet crossed for two tries and captain Mark Coyne was a standout. Youngster Damien Smith pushed his claims for a first grade spot in 1996 with a two-try showing in the Dragons' 24-12 quarterfinal victory over Melbourne. Scott Goulet's good form continued with another try as the youthful Dragons sprung to life to make it to the final four. Standing in front of them was a plucky South Queensland side that too had some quality youngsters pushing for starting places ahead of the 1996 season. Saints did just enough to edge past them 20 points to 18 in a thrilling contest as Wayne Bartram's haul of eight points got the Red V to the trophy final against South Sydney. Bartram's Midas touch continued into the final as the Dragons took out the trophy final with a 22 points to 14 win over Souths. Saints terrorised the Rabbitohs' edge defence with Lockford Bartram picking up 10 points via a try and three goals. It was a successful season for the Dragons who lost just one game and took home their first bit of silverware since the 1988 Panasonic Cup. More importantly, it bonded together a side that had been torn apart by uncertainty and turmoil in the early weeks of 1996. The Dragons minus their Super League stars took on Souths in the annual Charity Shield for their final hit out before the start of the 1996 season. Even without key players, they still had a solid nucleus with players such as Jeff Hardy, Wayne Bartram, Lance Thompson, Mark Coyne, David Barnhill and Scott Goulet. Adding in some of the young and up-and-coming stars like Ben Custo, Daniel Wagon and Damian Smith, St George had a solid side for the official curtain raiser to the regular season. A convincing 30 points to 6 victory inspired fans to believe that this season could be something special despite everything that had gone on in the background in recent weeks. The good news continued. As players found themselves being defeated in the courtrooms and Super League being denied permission by Justice James Burchett to start in 1996, players started trickling back to the club. Super League aligned clubs were still sticking firm prior to the court rulings, which saw six of them forfeit their first match. This meant the Dragons defeated the Western Reds in round one without having to take the field. The return of quality players wasn't quick enough to make an impact in the Dragons' second game of the season, a local derby clash with Cronulla. 
an inexperienced Dragon side missing the likes of Nathan Brown, Jason Stevens, Nick Zisti, Gordon Tallis, Noel Goldthorpe, and the capable Jason Donnelly went down 24 points to 16 to the Sharks at Cronulla. It was a gallant fight by the Dragons, but the class of Cronulla shone through despite some bright spots by young centre Damian Smith and back row Wayne Bartram. In other good news, Anthony Mundine had returned to training the week of the game against the Sharks. He was welcomed with open arms by his teammates, who, like the fans, knew that Mundine needed to be at his best in 1996 for the Saints to have success. The return of star halfback Noel Goldthorpe bolstered the Dragons ahead of their Round 3 clash against Newcastle. Goldthorpe, who had signed a Super League contract with the Hunter Mariners in mid-1995, had been stranded up north, but was desperate to come back and play some footy in 1996. Because I remember um, it was late, like um, when they, I think the ARL put an injunction in on um, Super League, so then they come to us, Super League told us that we, you know, we obviously, we can't get going playing, so you will have to go back to your clubs. And I quickly made I I knew where I wanted to go back and play for, and um, I rang Brian Johnson and um, John. I just said, mate, yes, we're happy to have you straight back. Mm. So I went back there, and I wasn't sure whether Super League were happy with me going to an ARL club, but I didn't really think about it because I didn't really want to play for anyone else anyway, and I just wanted to stick with um, the Dragons. So I went back there, and I think Benny Custer had played one or two games. Mm. And, um, yeah, and, you know, I come back and then obviously, um, you know, I got to start back there. Returning players were often given a bit of ribbing at first by teammates when they finally returned to the club. But the side was delighted to see them back, as Dragons winger Mark Bell explained. Oh, well, sometimes we have a bit of a, um, bit of a, uh, I suppose, clapping of the hands when the boys walk into, into the um, green <laughs> Are you coming to the other one? Yeah. Here they come, just like sheep. Just like sheep. <laughs> Here they come back. Just like sheep coming back, you know. We're just another one, boys. We'll see what turns up until we play. And, you know, and it wasn't, we didn't, there was nothing held personally against the player, uh, the players. It was nothing like it. Was, yeah. They were looking after themselves. We were looking after ourselves. We, we just, we just wanted to play footy. Yeah. You know and we knew that if we got back together, because we'd made the 95 side, 95 semi-finals, we, we got back together and we started playing well, and we'd have a good team because we had so many good players. The Dragons found the winners list for the first time in 1996, a resounding 34-30 win against Newcastle in Round 3. Goldthorpe's return a timely one, well, the likes of Mundine, Quinn and Stone had a field day for the Dragons. They won't catch him! Walford's away! Down 6-0, Newcastle turned to deft hands. Matthew John setting up Brett Grogan. He's looking for his winger! His winger's a mile behind him! Grogan! He does Approaching the break, Jeff Hardy's toe tapped. The Dragons ahead 12-6 until another sleight of hand. Jamie Ainsco stealing the floor for a match-levelling solo. 50 metres to go, but there's nobody closing the gap. But after sharing the card for the first half, the Dragons waltzed through the second. Hardy's there now, Quinn. Quinn will score. Troy Stone's try the third in 15 minutes. Oh, he's run straight through them. Four minutes later, a 34-12 lead. Using strictly ball work, the Knights hit back with three late tries, but their moves all too late, the Dragons winning 34-30. The responsibility of rebuilding this club is ours in 1996, and we're well aware of that. And uh, the addition of, of uh, people like Goldthorpe back to the club just helps us show the rugby league world that through all this turmoil, you know, St George has been able to uh, become solid and unified again. The settled atmosphere was working wonders for the Saints, who propelled themselves to six points from a possible eight after a local derby win against reigning Premier's Canterbury. David Waite's impact was being felt from the first grade team all the way down to reserve grade and jersey flag, as young up-and-comer and future first grader Lee Murphy explained. Yeah, it, it certainly filtered down. Um, so, it, uh, yeah, it, it filtered down, mate. The, the culture and the, and the feel in the club 
around those times was amazing. Um, and then in 96, I had the opportunity to train with the first grade team a little bit and, and just being around those blokes was uh, an unbelievable feeling. And, and uh, yeah, it was it was really, really good, mate. You, you couldn't put a value on that. Mm. And you probably – it's not something you can buy. It's something that it's instilled. Mm. And, and whether it's the – it comes from the top, whether it comes from the players, whether it comes from a, a holistic approach, I don't know what it is, but I think everyone's got to buy in. I think everyone's got to be involved in it. And uh, that, that era there, it was certainly involved. St. George ran in five tries to two to pull out a comprehensive victory and moved to fifth on the competition table. Extracting revenge for being bundled out of the 1995 final series by the Dogs, the Dragons dismantled their opponents with speed and skill after a tight first half. Still to win a match, Canterbury turned to a new face to spark the feel of old. Hazam El Masri scoring his first top grade try. The youngster, he'll score! St George's reply, as sharp as their fullback's hands. Quinn, Silver's after him, but Quinn! Trailing 6 4 at the break, the Dragons controlled the second half. Toy, they must score! The victory sealed by Anthony Mundine's second try, St George winning 26 6. The Dragons were making a much better fist of their draw in 1996 compared to their start in 1995. At the same stage last season, the Dragons had won just one game and had a horror start to the season. When you take a look at Saints' shocking preparation for the 1996 season, it has been a sensational effort by the players involved. Furthermore, the addition of former Gold Coast prop Colin Ward continued to add starch and depth to the Dragons' thin forward pack. After starting the season in reserve grade, Ward progressed his way into the Dragons' top 17. His ball skills were a highlight of his game in the win against the Dogs. The good times kept rolling for St George in round five, albeit in a spiteful game against a fired-up Canberra side at Cogra Oval. The Dragons leaned on the boot of Wayne Bartram's seven goals, whilst the sending-offs of Raiders forwards John Lomax and Quinton Pongia for high shots ensured the Dragons walked out of Cogra with the two competition points and continued their good early season form. From the kickoff, it was clear feelings were running high. Look at that defence coming in. Early luck was with the Raiders, and a wayward penalty resulted in their first try. Andruku, the player on the spot. Mundine hit back for the Dragons, a brilliant run complemented by a brilliant pass. In another blow for Canberra, Lomax was sent off just before half-time. Bartram's rest coming a couple of minutes early. Right across the head. One man up, St George looked winners, but the green machine was back in front when Nagus ran off Clive. Nagus gets into the corner. However, any thoughts of a courageous Canberra victory hit the turf when Pongia was also sent off with 20 minutes remaining. From there, the Dragons ran in two quick tries for their 30 points to 20 victory. That's the ball game. The uncertainty surrounding the club at the start of 1996 had dissipated and the fans on the terraces were enjoying a St George side that was free-flowing and playing some exciting football. In further good news for the club, prop Jason Stevens and his brother Paul returned after a long holdout over their inevitable move to Cronulla. 1996 would be the pair's final at the club, but Jason's big frame and superb offloading ability would only come as a plus for the Dragons in season 96. Further additions in Adrian Brunker and Kevin Campion from the Gold Coast had further boosted the Dragons' lineup and given them much needed depth. Campion had spent the previous four seasons at the Gold Coast and had signed a Super League contract with the Adelaide Rams. With the competition not getting off the ground in 96, he moved back to the Gold Coast but was encouraged by his good mate Brunker to head down to St George to try and get a roster spot. His hard-nosed style of defence would become imperative to St George's chances in 1996. So I, I actually went back to the Gold Coast um, and they'd started the new franchise at Gold Coast Chargers. And uh, I stayed down for a week, uh, a week and, um, and Adrian, who was a good mate of mine, uh, was obviously good uh, friends with David Wade. And yep. Adrian, Adrian had a... Uh, chat to David about bringing me down to St George and, and luckily enough I, I had the opportunity. This completes part one of the St George Dragons 1996 documentary.
Don't miss out on part two being released shortly where we take a look at the Dragons' phenomenal five-match losing streak which threatened to derail the 1996 campaign.